Uh, they've got a really great speaker lineup, so uh, check it out. Other than that, um, we've got Reed today. Reed's coming at us uh, and going to talk to us about, you know, programming languages where they shouldn't go, right? Yeah. yeah. Before we get jump into in his talk, though, let's uh, give a shout out to all of our lovely sponsors here who make this pizza that you're eating possible and uh, in this space. So, yeah. Anyway, without further ado, everybody give it up for Reed. Microphone. That sounds good. Yeah. Sounds like my conscience. I will talk. I will talk louder. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name. Uh, how do we get this going? Thank you. Um, yeah. My name is Reed Spool. Um, I do independent software stuff. Oh, I forgot about this. I should have changed my slides because you guys on the side, you can't see the lower left corner. That's where all the funny bits are. So. Let's just get this out of the way. I do independent software stuff. That's my Twitter handle and my GitHub. Um, I'm gonna, I'll post these slides uh, in the meetup group in case any of you are not uh, totally bored. <laughs> um, here's what we're talking about today. Big fish in a little pond. I have like four names for this talk that I, all, I think are really clever and funny. Um, or a Turing complete language rudely appended onto a URL, or uh, as I put it in the meetup, um, what do we call it? Thank you. <laughs> what do we call it? Uh, uh, programming languages where they don't belong. Um, here's a little bit about what I'm planning to talk about, um, but we can go off course. We're going to break down what a URL is in case uh, 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 you've never thought about the different components. Should we mess with the URL? I think so. Uh, what kind of language could we put in there? What do I mean by concatenative? What is factor? And finally, my uh, project, uh, the URL programming language. All right, uh, before, before I start, I'm gonna leave it on this slide for a second. Before I start, uh, who here knows at least one programming language? Writes in it, does the, their homework, uh, that not, did it, was everyone really excited when you first learned a programming language and you could do all the math homework you ever did in school and you were like, yes, but you were already too late. <laughs> you know, it's really disappointing. All right, uh, who, uh, who knows about functional programming languages? Functional programming languages. All right, keep your hand up if you use a functional programming language regularly. All right, a little less. We got some iffies, that's cool. Uh, and, then, and then finally, who has heard of concatenative languages? We've got a few. All right. Cool stuff. So um, it's, it's, uh, concatenative is a different paradigm than functional. We're going to get there. Uh, I was just interested to know about y'all. All right. So what's a URL? Uh, a URL is a location and a mechanism for retrieval of something. What something? Well, it's a uniform resource locator, so we're going to call the something a resource. Uh, what, what is a resource? I don't know. It's pretty up in the air. Um, it, usually, it's a document, like a web page. Uh, sometimes it's a PDF. Sometimes it's a music file. There are all sorts of things. Sometimes it's like the Twitter homepage. It's this amorphous blob of information that's constantly changing. You know, if you try to get that resource twice, you're going to get different information. Interesting. Um, all right. What's in a URL? What's, what are the different parts? This is the most boring look at a URL ever. Um, pay attention, though. There will be a quiz next block. We have a schema name, colon, two slashes, then a host. Uh, then there's a colon, then a port number, maybe. Then there's a path. Then there's a query string optionally, and a fragment identifier. So down here, I have an example of a real site that is probably not porn. Um, <laughs> um, so we have 
Uh, here's the uh, schema name, HTTP, that's the protocol that we're gonna use to get this resource. Then a colon and two slashes. Who decided on that? I don't know. It's <laughs> the uh, least fun to type. Uh, then this whole thing right here is the host up to that slash right here. Then images.html, that's the path. Then we have a question mark, that sets off the optional query string. And finally, a hash mark at the end sets off the optional fragment identifier. That one's got everything. Good stuff. Um, here's, here's a more uh, visual broken down look. Um, I don't know where I got this image, so I'm gonna brush past that because I don't feel good about using that without a reference. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, w what, are, what are all those parts used for? Uh, the World Wide Web relies on the schema name, the colon, two slashes, and the host. That's all the World Wide Web cares about as far as um, HTTP and the actual standards that are in books, uh, in white papers and, and such. Um, and in your routers and in the uh, DNS. Uh, so that is, that's these, this part, up to that third slash. Only the browser cares about the fragment identifier so that part at the end. Uh, the server uh, will probably never see that unless you do some, some weird stuff. And uh, this is the important part for me. What happens between the third slash, that one, and the hash mark is entirely in the server's hands. Whoa. I keep forgetting I have this thing. Yes. So uh, this, this experiment uh, that I've done uh, rudely appending a language onto a URL is uh, a back-end experiment. It's a, an experiment it, with servers. So I want to play with what's in the server's hands. Oh, uh, and now a huge block of text. I'm sorry I showed you that without warning. That was scary. Um, I, I want to talk about REST. Um, who, who here is familiar with the term REST? Uh, you might have heard it as RESTful APIs. Um, you should go home and get a rest. Um, so in uh, 1994 uh, two uh, uh, to 2000, this guy, Roy Thomas Fielding, who is the RTF in RTFM, um, bad joke, um, <laughs> uh, he, he, wrote this, uh, he wrote his doctoral dissertation on, um, on <laughs> the internet, on what, how servers should act on the internet. And there was a big section that he called rest which stands for representational state transfer, um, which is totally, I hope that's not me. That would be awkward. Um, uh, uh, okay, and I'm, I'm just gonna read some selections from this uh, about REST because he, he is uh, the reason that we have um, the, the internet that we have uh, in large part. There was a lot of other people, <laughs> but, but he wrote a really, uh, really awesome, uh, uh, really, really long and dense uh, dissertation on REST. Okay, so it was, uh, the first edition was developed in 1994 for, uh, al along with HTTP. So HTTP is the, uh, the underlying transfer mechanism for this stuff. Uh, REST is just an idea on top of HTTP, but it was built along with it. At first they, t they t called it the HTTP object model, uh, but that didn't sound right. Uh, so they, they changed it to representational straight, state transfer to evoke an image of how a well-designed web application behaves. A network of web pages where the user progresses through the application by selecting links, resulting in the next page being transferred to the user and rendered for their use. Uh, so this is a description of the web as most of us uh, use it and it appears to us. Um, it is not, however, however intended to capture all possible uses of the web protocol standards. We're gonna have a different use for it in just a second. Um, uh, the important point is that REST does capture all of the aspects that are considered central to the behavior and performance requirements of the web. Uh, boring. REST is optimized for the common case so that the constraints it applies to uh, will be optimized for the common case. We're not the common case today. But uh, that is to say, the reason I put this up here is because, um, to, to make that point, that what I'm talking about is not a better way, uh, it's just an idea, and we should probably still be doing this stuff like in the future. Um, 
All right, one more huge block of text, and I promise there's no more. It is the nature of every engineer to define things in terms of the characteristics of the components that will be used to compose the finished product. The web doesn't work that way. <laughs> you shouldn't be an engineer when you're working on the web, is what he's saying. Don't think like that. Just go architecture. Just use uh, the constraints of the communication model between components. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, too much text. I really, I really just like his line here, the web doesn't work that way. Because what I'm about to talk about uh, as far as the URL programming language is uh, some characteristics of components that we will compose the finished product out of. So he, this guy, Roy, is telling me don't do this. This is really dumb. <laughs> All right. Uh, so why should we, why, why do I think it's worthwhile to explore? Uh, the current standards are restrictive. So he's, the uh, RTF was literally applying restrictions. He's saying don't do the crazier engineering stuff. Uh, make it as simple as possible so that it, it works really fast, really well. Uh, here's another point. Loading a rich web page to use their tool to retrieve a resource can be ridiculous. So for example, uh, if you want to search on Google for uh, Google Images for, uh, let's say, 400 by 600 animated GIFs of cats, you can do that, but it's a lot of clicking, okay? Why not instead give some composable tools that you can say, you know, you can put those numbers in instead of clicking uh, Google Images, advanced search, and then going through a form. Why not use a programming language? Uh, the address bar is the most universal input box. Uh, I got this stat from a Pew Research report this year. 54% of adults in emerging economies are internet users. That's what they call themselves. They identify as internet users, um, which means they've all touched an address bar. That's a lot of people. Uh, and that's a lot of people that maybe we didn't consider uh, as internet users before. So a lot of people have messed and seen, at least seen, typed into this address bar. All right, uh, why, why shouldn't we do this? I, I should have changed this slide. It says why not, and then it has a pro and a con thing. I still don't understand what I'm going for here. So, uh, okay, so nowadays with um, software as a service, like I mentioned, Twitter, uh, your Facebook feed, resources on the internet are no longer just static pages. There's a lot of stuff going on when you go to facebook.com. There's a lot of code that gets run. And uh, hiding all of that is really useful to end users, but why not, why not make some composable tools? And um, Rails, no Django, uh, not so much WordPress, not so much Apache, but you can, you, we have tools now to make really interesting things out of servers. Um, so best practices ease a lot of headaches. So I, what I'm about to uh, show to you is probably a resource management and security nightmare. Um, I hope that I express enough to you about it that you can tell me why. I would love to have that conversation. I don't know why I keep working on it because it's obviously like a terrible, terrible idea in terms of those two things. So let's have that conversation. You can uh, knock me out of it. Uh, okay. so. This is, this is one of the huge fallouts from, if, if you've ever uh, read something on RESTful APIs, um, they talk about this all the time. So, hey, if we, uh, if we make our, our URLs really nice, then people will be able to remember them and just like type in stuff. Uh, I've never seen a user do that, ever. Um, I, I've, seen, I've done it uh, myself, uh, but I'm, this is my job, so like I should, I hope that I can figure some of that stuff out. Real people do not remember long URLs, even if they are set up nicely. Um, so that's another uh, great antithesis to uh, my little project. Whatever. He's moonwalking. All right. <laughs> All right, so um, what, what, whatever, what, <laughs> what should we do? How, how should we go about this, um, plugging a programming language onto a URL? Uh, here's an idea. Hey, look, like I can, I can just type in Ruby, print, 
and then a string. So this is really, this gives me a lot of control. Now I can, uh, I can change that text. I can put my name in there, hello read, right? I have more control over the output. I don't know what that produces. Maybe this produces a web page that just says hello read. I don't know. Uh, but that's more control than our standard um, www.google.com slash something something. This looks like a really bad idea though. Uh, here's more Ruby code where I define a function for later use, a composable, uh, I don't know, component. <laughs> And, uh, but I have to use new lines. Nobody likes new lines in their URLs. So we're gonna have to deal with that. Uh, this looks way worse. I still don't know, this is, this is gonna be on your quiz next block, what, what this code actually does. <laughs> but here's some lists. And what I really don't like about this is that you have, you have syntax on both sides of what you're trying to write. So like if you wanna change something in here, if you wanna add another list in here, you might end up put it, go, you know, having to go back and put a um, parentheses later. All right, so C like syntax is bad, Lisp is all right, but there's a lot of parentheses. So enter concatenative programming languages. This is, uh, this learning about these things is what made me interested in um, working on this project is how I thought of it was, um, well, hey, uh, let's just tack stuff on. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how we just tack stuff on with compat concatenated programming languages. So here's a small program. Can we guess what it does? 12, yeah. Okay, um, so this is three. I'm, I'm gonna go more in depth as to how this works in a moment. But uh, first, we have three, then we have four, then we have times. So uh, times is acting on what was already there, the three and the four. All right, going further, three, four times, two, three plus times. All right, that's looking crazy, especially uh, if you're familiar with other types of programming languages, you probably are just shocked at two operators next to each other. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna back out of my little presentation here and uh, go into not my project, uh, but a well-formed uh, sort of uh, uh, concatenative language. Working out, all right, let's get the aspect ratio here, and then, ooh, yeah, sweet. All right, cool. Uh, so this is a programming language called Factor. Uh, I have, I, I just found it with my explorations of uh, programming languages, uh, concatenative languages. Uh, it's really um, nicely built. Uh, they have tons and tons of tools and uh, functions, but I'm just gonna show you the basics. Uh, so the, the basic idea is that we have a stack. You can't see it yet, but let me put something on it. Put a two there. Can everybody see the two? Cool, all right, so I hit enter, and we get the result is a data stack with the number two on it. Oh, it's real close to the side there. Let me bring it off. Oh no, I did that. Did I just break our projector? wires over here, I'm gonna push this a little out so I don't do that again. All right, so we got a two on the data stack. I'm gonna put a three on there. Cool, we got a two and a three. The order is, of course, important. Now I'm gonna do an operation called a plus. Boom, five. So a very specific uh, order of things happen. First we push two on the stack, then we pushed three on the stack, then plus, took two things off the stack because plus is a binary operator. So it went pop, pop, it did its plus thing, and then it pushed the result back onto the stack. And we get a five back on the stack. Here, I'll try to plus again. Oh no, data stack underflow. I don't know what that means, probably bad. <laughs> let's, um, let's put something else on the stack. Let's do a times, okay. So uh, notice that uh, unlike maybe other interpreters you've used, I didn't have to write an entire program to get it to execute on the line. I just wrote a single operator. I think that's really key uh, for uh, why I thought this was a, a cool thing. Um, so, so let me clear it. 
and so 2, 3, plus is the same thing as 2, 3, plus. Maybe that doesn't seem like such a big deal, um, but then uh, that, that allows su uh, supreme amount of composition. So if you already have stuff on the stack, I can come along and plus it. Or I can write a program that has uh, 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 all that stuff already in it. All right, so back to, I had an example over here. What do we have? Boop. Three, four times two, three plus times. Three, four times two, three plus times, just for round it out. We get a 60, cool. Let's see some other features about uh, concatenative languages. So uh, first of all, three times is also valid syntax. Um, oh, that's too far down. Let's clear it, bump it up. Cool. Three times is a program. It's a composition of two functions. Three is a function that pushes three onto the stack. Times is a function which takes two things off the stack and pushes back their product. So three times is also a program. Uh, we can write functions like that. So if I push this onto the stack by hitting enter, we see that that's now one, that's one thing. And that's a legal uh, thing. It's called a quotation. It's a quotation. <laughs> I think I'm funny, guys. I'm gonna call that quotation, it's a callable. Uh, and what that does is exactly what it would have done if I had just written it. So we get the result of uh, 63 times. Sweet. Um, let's clear everything off. I'm going to show you some more stuff. So uh, if, you've, if you've seen functional programming uh, before, you can also do fun functional stuff. So uh, of course, a list of numbers is also a legal program. So we can push that on the stack. Uh, we can now just do something to it 10 times. So let's say, um, or not 10 times, how many numbers do we have there? We have eight numbers, so let's, seven times, let's just add it. Oh, that didn't work. We need to call that. Push all those onto the stack. Then seven times, we'll just add them all together. That looks like a heck of a lot like, ah, don't do that. That looks a heck of a lot like reducing. Same result. Do they equal each other? Oh no, you're too far down. I don't know what equal sign does. <laughs> All right, so maybe I should have noted, I'm not, a proficient at this language. I don't use it for work. I just think it's really cool. All right, back to, uh, back to a Prezi. Oh, cool. Ah. All right. Concatenative programming is so called because it uses function composition instead of function application. So normally, uh, with you guys who are familiar with functional programming, if I say f of g, uh, that means I'm calling the function f with the function g as a parameter. In concatenative programming, when you put those two together, you're just, um, you're literally composing them by putting them next to each other. So three times is a composition of two functions. Uh, here's another big block of text. Um, I'll skip over that. All right, so there's factor. Um, I'm not that good at it. It's stack-based. There are concatenative languages that aren't stack-based, but they act like they are stack-based. Uh, the, um, the, the steps are very simple to execute them. First, the functions are composed. Then the result is applied to whatever's on the stack. The stack gets shifted when uh, that application happens. Then whatever's left on the stack is your answer. So um, let's bring this little guy to the interpreter. That's what we did before. I went out of order. 
I'm sorry, guys. All right, so uh, before we go to uh, my little experiment, here's what I think about the internet. I think users should be empowered, so let's give them some composable tools, even if Roy doesn't want us to. Let's provide an interpreter as a service. I think concatenative languages have all the right properties, and whatever's left on the stack, the user gets back. So let's go to the web with that, with those thoughts in mind. All right, so, uh, man, it's so hard to see the URL bar. I should consider that. Here we go, I'm gonna zoom in. Y'all can see what happened. So here's my little Heroku app. Uh, it's at concatenative spelled wrong dot Heroku app dot com uh, slash execute. And then here's a little program. Uh, the, the spaces get replaced by percent twenties uh, when you hit enter. And here's the result. So as I said, uh, this is a server experiment. Um, so the front end is the most ugly front end that I've ever personally produced in my life. Um, so sorry, but here is the result of that program getting run. So here is the input as a program, and here's the output. So I modeled my language off of Factor. Um, it uses a lot of the same properties. Um, I'm not as good at writing languages as they are, so uh, it doesn't work so good, but this is real, real simple. Uh, this uh, concatenated, no pun intended, Hello and world. So that's a simple program, and we shoved it all right in the URL bar. So here's, here's why I think concatenative languages are the right thing, because I can just go ahead and add more stuff and do even more stuff. Real simple, just by adding to the end of the URL. Uh, you definitely can't do that with Google. All right, let me show you some fun use cases. So it's cool that to make a language that is on the internet because you can make its domain the internet, meaning that uh, hello world is a pretty boring example unless you're on a text interface. So why not, let's make our hello world like a GIF. Everybody loves GIFs. So uh, this is just my uh, convenient uh, input here, I hit enter, and that gets translated up there. I'm gonna scroll back up here. Hello. I'm so glad that's not inappropriate. <laughs> Always a risk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so hello was pushed onto the stack. We can break that down. If we just type um, hello there, the entire result is hello. Uh, it's a link right there because uh, it just does the exact same thing. If I click on it, it does the same thing. You can send that link to somebody else if you want to say hello to them in the most uh, roundabout way possible. Then the function gif uh, pops one thing off the stack, goes to Giphy, and searches for a gif. Wow, we're killing it today with the gifts. All right, so <laughs> let's, let's go a little further. Um, let's find, uh, let's see, I'm gonna type in happy, sad, uh, crazy. And so that, I put that in a list in those square brackets, and I'm gonna pick a random one of those. Okay, so the result was happy. If I refresh, we'll get a different one. Maybe. All right, we got sad twice. It's a sad day when that happens. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm gonna uh, duplicate it. So now we get two sads. And then I'm gonna find a GIF for it. Same way as before. Okay, cool, so now we've got, we've just built out of composable tools a random GIF uh, generator with a known input. So now we know, now we know uh, it's not just like Giphy's completely random generator. We have, we have known seeds there, so that's cool. 
uh, what if we wanted to do that, I don't know, a bunch of times? Well, we can put all that in a list, a quotation. Okay, so that's, it, it doesn't get run. Uh, the only thing that gets run is the quotation itself gets pushed onto the stack. And now let's do that 10 times. Okay, cool, so we got a little crazy, a little sad, a little sad, nothing inappropriate yet. We love that. All right, cool. Uh, let's, let's think about a, uh, a different use case. Um, well, let me, uh, I'll, I'll back up for a second. So I made this uh, front end as, as terrible looking as possible, but you can very easily imagine that uh, the things that get returned here could be um, put in a basic uh, HTML layout with a nice style, maybe some bootstrap going on. Everybody loves bootstrap. So um, very quickly, um, we, we could be making something that looks nice. That was not my goal. Uh, I wanted to scare you guys. Let's go into a different use case here. What if I wanted to, um, I don't know, make, make uh, let's see, give, give you a link to do almost the exact same thing. So, but for any word you want. So I'm gonna make a form. Input, all right. So here's my form uh, syntax here. Over here, we're gonna do a word. So that's gonna be, well, let's just see what happens there. All right, so we got a, a form, an actual HTML form. Uh, and it, if you guys can see, it has a placeholder text word. Uh, when I run it, it won't do anything. That's where this first quotation in that syntax comes in. That's what we're gonna do with the word. So let's uh, extract it first and then get a gift for it. Oh, well, let's duplicate it too so we can remember. Because uh, GIF, uh, the GIF function is gonna pop the word off the stack. And so um, we'll duplicate it so that we can see what, er, and make sure that we wrote the right thing. So uh, let's try, um, I type in inappropriate, no. Um, I don't know, JavaScript, they have good ones for that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, we duplicated the word, and yeah, cool. So, so let's just back up here and think about this for a second. Uh, this URL, the URL we're looking at up here, complex though it may be, I could send this to somebody. I could text this to one of you in the room. And then you would be presented with this form. You could see what's gonna happen when you run that form or when you uh, run it, but you didn't have to write that. So I made something for you out of these composable pieces. And I don't know, let's try again. Cool. Let's, uh, let's take this one step further as far as use cases go. Let's say that uh, you just had paid some uh, monies to somebody. Oh, let me get that up there. You just paid some monies to somebody and you're not sure how much the tip should be. All right, so that's gonna give us a form with a total and a tip input. Uh, let's do some trippy uh, concatenative programming to calculate the tip. So first we take the total out of the response. Then we multiply it by the tip Wait, we have to take the tip out too. Really hoping this doesn't get inappropriate. Tip, take that out. Minute. So the tip, when I extract something from an object, that object gets thrown away. So I'm gonna need to duplicate it first. Okay, and now, so let's try that. Let's see what happens. 
Okay, we've got our total and our tip form. So we'll write 17 and 23. All right, so we have on the, uh, on the stack here, we have a form data object, so that's the result, and a 23. Now I'm gonna swap those two so that we get the form data object back on top, and then I'm gonna take out the total from the form data. Now I can multiply them together. Actually, why don't we add one, no, we'll multiply them together. Okay, so here's the trap with uh, concatenated programming, is that there's no variables, so you have to maintain your stack very nicely and shuffle it around uh, to get everything where you want. So instead, uh, I'm gonna switch these two. I'm gonna take the tip out a second. This will be easier. I'm gonna add one to the tip amount and then we'll multiply the two together and that should get us a result. Let's make this form. We made a form. Uh, we'll say we have 18 and the tip amount was 0.25. We were happy with our service. And there we go, a result. So once again, I could send this form, this link up here, to you, and now you have a tip calculator uh, by going to this web page. And that's not something I thought of when I made this. That's just something I composed out of uh, reusable parts. So um, I hope that I've expressed to you enough random information by now that you can tell me why this is a terrible idea. And um, I think we have uh, plenty of time for questions, I hope. But that's it, that's it for the Prezi. Thank you. Any questions? I've stunned you all. Uh, hold on, he's gonna give you that microphone. So this is being recorded, uh, so just, I, I, I can also repeat it for you, I'm sorry. I'll repeat it. <laughs> okay. What's the limit to the URL? Is it 64K? The length? The, yeah, the length okay, of so, characters. Okay, uh, so that's, that's a great question. Um, I, I did a bunch of research on that. The actual length limit to the URL um, is pretty much non-existent. Uh, it was, in IE, it was like 2,000 characters back in the day, and then they lifted that, um, and now it's, it's probably in, in the two to three bytes range. Um, so the reason that factor is called factor is because you can uh, take out any piece of that and uh, factor it into um, a, another reusable component. You can define your own word. And um, so that, that when I was thinking about this, I was like, okay, we're gonna, you know, with any complex program, you're gonna reach any limit you get really, really fast for the length of the URL. Uh, factor provides a really nice way to extract huge chunks of that and define it elsewhere. So you could save it on the server as you know, an alias or, or a word um, and then use that word uh, in your code. So you're not rewriting uh, huge amounts. But yeah, that's, that's a great call, great question. Yeah. Can you compose the URLs in the URL? So, so instead of defining it on the server, define the alias as a, as a URL to the pro of another program. Um, yeah, so um, actually, I, I think I need to stop this for my sanity. Um, so uh, defining an alias is a call on a URL. So you can define it earlier on in the chain and then use it later. Um, does that answer your question though? Yeah, as far as, um, th there's no real, real good use to composing entire programs on top of each other um, because you still have to use, and I say no good use, I mean no stylistic use because you still have to use uh, the whole chunk at the beginning, like HTTP, colon, slash, slash, all that. Right, yes, Bitly is, is beautiful and uh, I think is the future. Bitly's the future. <laughs> if you take nothing else away, <laughs> Bitly's the future. Yeah. So you're using the URL bar as the input uh, uh, for your REPL. Mm -hmm. um, just curious, what, what, what was the motivation uh, for this? 
project? Wow, yeah. Um, <laughs> college? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. Uh, I think I found the um, I found the uh, concatenative paradigm, and I was thinking already a lot about REST. Um, I work a lot on the internet, and how and just appending things. They seem to go really well together. That in REST you um, are supposed to append things to the path to get more specific about the resource you want, right? You want google.com slash images slash, you know, dimensions slash gif or something in, in, some, in some REST universe. And uh, with this, you're taking data that's on the stack and appending things together in order to use that data in a more specific way. Somehow, one late night at 3 a.m., I had this crazy idea and, uh, yeah. As far as motivation goes, um, again, I am motivated until someone tells me this is a bad idea. Like, I can't get it out of my head, basically, at this point. So please, uh, I won't be offended if you're like, yeah, that, that's stupid. <laughs> I've written a lot of JavaScript in the past, and some of it was public, some was secure. And this would be a fantastic idea to eliminate a lot of the load times because you wouldn't have to wait for it to load before you could use it, and you'd be using right. very specifically. So in that sense, if there was an interpreter into the browser, I think that'd be an advantage. I, this still has to hit the server, right? Yeah, so all the code being run is, is being run on a server. Uh, there's no front-end JavaScript except that takes this and appends it to the URL when I hit enter. So um, all, all of the stuff is being run on the server. Um, so th the use case I used to give most often was uh, reducing round trips back and forth, right? So for the Giphy example, um, if you wanted to do that with Giphy, you'd have to go to www.giphy.com. Uh, Giphy is just a GIF search engine, by the way. And they have a big search bar like Google. And you'd have to type in happy. And then hit enter. And then you'd have to copy all those. And then you'd have to type in sad. Hit enter. Copy all those. Uh, crazy. Copy all those. And then you could have a list with all three of them together. And that's a lot of round trips back and forth. So um, I think there is some use definitely to that. Um, did you also have a question about, about security? In there? No, no, I, I just wouldn't put anything secure in there because you obviously can see it. But I yeah. thought that if there was a separation between the two, I think it's a very powerful idea. And it, it, yeah. Me too. You're not helping me out. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Tell me, if, t get me off of this. <laughs> yeah. So is it multi-user? So is there only one stack on the server? So if we're both hitting it, am I picking up parts of your right. stack? Yes. Okay. So um, the stack, there's a, it's actually stateless. So the stack um, doesn't exist on the server. Yeah. The stack uh, is, is uh, ephemeral. It, it comes only into existence for one URL, and at the end of the URL, yep. it, it winks back out of existence. So if you're very right. independent. Yeah. So it's not like the factor interpreter where it's saving what's on the stack. Uh, every the the result, the resultant stack is sent back yeah. to me and shown on the web browser and disposed of. Some of them. Okay. Yeah, there's there's more. <laughs> there's more in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the back. You're with me on this one. Um, <laughs> just trying to think how to expand this to the next level uh, and go beyond a little bit more stateless. But for each time you post, um, the command that you give is somewhat, it can be duplicated. Therefore, it can be stored. Therefore, you can keep giving an ID. So each time you type a command, however long it is, your server could then store it yeah. generate, I don't know how far you want to go with it, some kind of ID, you turn that back, now you've just stored a function. Right. In the smallest form possible, like as a, a pointer. A and virtual machine. And use yeah. that. Yeah. And it's like kind of caching your functions. Yeah, absolutely. And then you could go wherever your mind takes you with that one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, ex yeah, expanding that out, that I, I definitely appreciate that line of thought. Um, 
if, if, if we can get the server to remember things that it's done recently um, and, and not have to rerun that code, that will definitely save a lot of time. I think, uh, and, and then giving you back a pointer to it. Um, Yeah, so that's the, the uh, so point of view would be machine readable. Right. So I've I've personally kept uh, my use cases to showing the user stuff that that's totally useful um, t for me to look at. But uh, you know, you saw the form data object in there. That's not useful. You have to unpack it for that to to be uh, useful. You go here and then here. Oh yeah, we got here first. I think like building on that, maybe um, just use it for memoization, like store store a hash of the the function that you've defined yeah, and, the, and the result of it. And if somebody runs that again, then spit that back. And then that would alleviate like, there's a vulnerability of, of um, denial of service attacks where people are trying to run like, run this a million times. <laughs> and yeah, kind of no, it's, it, it's vulnerable, I, I admit. Um, I think uh, memoizing, memoizing is a great idea. I'm, I, I am not going to optimize it until I find real use cases. <laughs> is how I feel, <laughs> but it's a great idea. Yeah. Can uh, can I store any arbitrary string and inject that into the browser? Oh, I I I hear you using the word inject. So like um, script tag. Yeah. Um, please tag. try. Please try. Like I said, this is the, this is uh, parsed as a language. Okay. So um, it, it, there shouldn't be any un, uh, unsanitized input anywhere. Um, absolutely, though, if, if I am, am talking about uh, making composable web objects that then get sent back to a user, well, I mean, you could send my grandma a link that showed her anything or put any script tag in there for, So, but like your in pleasure. your hello world example, like those are just strings right. that then get like dropped into that, like, that input. Like yeah, I mean, we can, we can try it. So you could like concatenate script tag alert hello. Or meow. No, oh, yeah, sure. Cool. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> yeah, so, so hopefully. Um, that is cross site scripting, yeah. Because, so. Because, um, here, I'll we'll, we'll show you how it can be cross-site. So, yeah, that's funny. Absolutely, that's, that's a vulnerability. Um, so I can now send, send your grandma this, um, and instead of meow, I can write, um, please email your credit card number to, um, that doesn't seem to be working. Actually, I think that code might have been run. Um, yeah, so that code was run before it hit the server uh, down here. Yeah, it's like if you're typing all of the thing that I'm showing. Yeah. Like that's where it's getting injected. Right, right here. Yeah. So you can see that it's building a, a link for me, and that's where it got injected. Um, but if you noticed when I tried to do it, actually in the URL, it got sanitized and cleaned. Um, nope, it didn't. <laughs> oh, actually, no, it happened again. It happened again in the same place. That's crazy. No, it's pretty funny. <laughs> Everybody here cares enough <laughs> to think it's real funny. <laughs> yeah. So another uh, security naysayer type question here we've been given. Simple examples of things like, you know, give me back this form. That's a function that you have. Um, I'm thinking about things that the server would normally do, maybe in a RESTful aspect where you have uh, more frameworky things like authentication, authorization, maybe a more privileged function, something like, a, you know, a credit card transfer. Have you thought about the implications of, of that? I haven't figured out a way to, that, that would even be remotely secure for my application to do that. Um, I do have a way to, um, if you saw the form data response object, so if we, if we make a form here, ah, stop. Um, we'll make a quick form, word called meow, and, and the, the um, what is done with the result, 
what is done with the result of the form is nothing, absolutely nothing. And then I type something in here. Um, what's on the stack is, is a form data object. So something was posted and it's now hidden from me until I start to extract information. Um, so there is a way to post stuff, but uh, yeah, I, I, haven't found a, I haven't thought of a good way to, to post sensitive information. Um, and and uh, yeah, to, to be authenticated would be a good first step, but. We got time for one more. Yeah. Um, would it be enough to use HTTPS uh, because then of course the URL wouldn't be vulnerable to packet yeah. inspections. You couldn't see the URL or like generate a hash of any sensitive information, salt it and send that back to the server before any sensitive data is passed in the clear over the network? Yeah, so um, as Mr. Uh, Perez uh, said last time, your security is only as good as your weakest link. The, the, that, that would solve a, a huge number of problems as far as uh, all the problems that HTTPS and encrypting the, the sent information solves, which is uh, nobody could get into it theoretically. Um, on the outside, but there are there are still a number of security issues present. Um, like for example, sending me a form that does something um, does something evil, yeah. or you know maybe I write a service um, that uh, is a facade to this this beautiful secure service, and uh, I send you a, a URL language link to that instead, and so you think you're running it on uh, the amazing golden service. But you're really running it on um, that th the prince who really needs some money. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You can build a phishing site in here very simply. Yeah. <laughs> Teach a man to fish, right? All right. Thank you, Reed. Everybody, get over for Reed. Thanks, guys. Great, great discussion. All right, we'll see you next week, maybe. Uh, somebody, somebody come volunteer. Load here.